Uh, it's fantastic to see you all here this afternoon. Thank you so much to Karina for organizing us all to be here. Um, I've heard the previous sessions have been absolutely fascinated um, by the discussion. I'm also uh, took heart, I think it was from uh, Georgia, who, who argued that actually, if you don't know anything about quantum, do not be afraid uh, and join in, because I'm a professor of law and regulatory governance, and I'm uh, president of the British Academy, which is the National Academy for Social Sciences and the Humanities, and I've also been doing some work with the creative industries. So in terms of thinking about interdisciplinarity um, and how those from the outside, as it were, can come and join the conversation on quantum. I'm your little guinea pig for this afternoon, because <laughs> that is what I'm doing. Um, but it is an absolutely fascinating topic, and I think there is no doubt it will have the most important uh, transformational implications for society, for our economy, for geopolitics, as we've heard. And in which case, it's impossible to have such a conversation without having social sciences, humanities, and the creative arts in the room and participating in that. So I am absolutely delighted today to be um, on a panel with some remarkable people whose uh, biographies could fill just the 40 minutes alone. But I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves relatively briefly, first of all, um, and then ask them a series of questions taking heed also from Karina's opening words, which are no jargon, and also from the first panel, use cases. Really think about the use cases and the examples um, that are really at the cutting edge of how we think our society, economy, and politics might be tr transformed in different areas. So, without further ado, Roman. Excellent. So, um, good afternoon, everybody. So, I'm Roman Dorus. I'm uh, the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Multiverse Computing and also a professor of theoretical physics. I'm a physicist, okay? I got, you know, I have more than 20 years of, uh, of uh, technical knowledge of uh, quantum technologies. I did a PhD back in Barcelona. I was a researcher in Australia at the University of Queensland and the Max Planck Institute. I was a professor in Germany also at the University of Mainz, and now I'm also a professor in Spain at some point. During all this trajectory with more than 100 papers and thousands of citations, we decided to build Multiverse, okay? Uh, Multiverse Computing right now is the largest quantum software company in Europe, okay? Right, uh, you know, our focus is to build software so that you guys can use quantum computers, okay? Software with, uh, fo with a focus on industry applications and with a focus on making these applications easy for the people that are not experts, okay? So right now we are around 90 people. We have four offices, headquarters in Spain, also very big offices in Canada and Paris and also in Munich. We are working now in more than 10 industry verticals. <clears throat> so we are working in finance, in energy, in logistics, manufacturing, defense, space as well, and so on. And we have lots of use cases going on using both quantum and quantum inspired methods. Okay, nice to be here. Thank you. Denise. Does my, yep, okay. Hi everyone, my name's Denise Ruffner and I come from a different side of the quantum world than Ramon. Um, I'm a biologist, uh, but I also do business development. And I think I have the best job of anybody because I get to go talk to customers and I get to learn about what they're thinking and hear creative ideas. And for me, it's the most fun when I get to a customer and they're really thinking out of the box. And so I have the great honor of taking that information back to the company and seeing what we can do with it. And it's a blast. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Scott Ferris. I'm the CEO of Inflection. Uh, I don't have a quantum background, so um, I'm a finance guy, uh, quite simply. But uh, no, my career has been uh, working with really great scientists to uh, build and scale their ideas into commercial businesses. And I arrived at Inflection two years ago. Uh, for those of you in the room, we, you may know us formally as Cole Quanta. We have a fairly large presence here in the UK and in an area that we're continuing to grow and expand. But uh, uh, Inflection is focused uh, on a, really a portfolio of quantum capabilities, uh, hardware and software. Uh, on the hardware side, we build everything from advanced uh, quantum optical clocks, uh, memory modules, uh, uh, as, as well as other sensors, the whole way up through computers. Uh, but we also have a very large and robust uh, uh, quantum uh, software effort. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Daskal. Uh, I'm Director of Quantum Product Management at the Fidelity Center for Applied Technology, which is a research and innovation hub in Fidelity Investments. Um, so my, my background is a bit funny. I, I have a, 
a number of years in product and brand marketing uh, and an academic background in the philosophy and foundations of quantum mechanics and quantum information. Uh, so I took this position at Fidelity where I've kind of combined this a little bit to look at quantum technologies and how they can start to be developed into, into products, for lack of a better term. Um, so FCAT is, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, I sit in FCAT and I'm in the quantum and future computing incubator, which really is tasked with looking at any and every way that quantum and other future computing architectures uh, will be impacting Fidelity and all of our customers. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, so Roman, I'm going to turn to you first. We've had a little bit um, of a hint of discussion about um, why quantum is so crucial to AI and what the limitations are to AI that quantum might be able to overcome. Could you just expand on those a little bit for yeah, us? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, there are huge limitations on, on AI. You know, all these new generation of AI methods that uh, all of you have heard about, you know, about all these language models, all of you have used uh, probably ChatGPT, okay? This works extremely well, right? It's fantastic when you use it, but the problem is that, you know, building that system, training that system, it was uh, the computational cost and the energy cost, it was just incredible. I think it was a hundred million dollar in an electricity bill just to train the system, okay? And it still doesn't work well, no? And the expectation is that this is gonna double every, every few years, and plus, you know, there is an increasingly exponential demand. So this is, I mean, we are gonna be burning the planet if we continue at this stage. I mean, we cannot just continue like this because the cost is so huge, okay, that we need to do, we need to do something. So the problem of AI, okay, is that the cost not just in energy, but also in money, okay, and in memory and every cost that you can imagine, it's just growing hyper exponentially, okay? We need to find solutions to actually bring this down, to be able to compress it, to make it more efficient. And the only way to do that is with quantum and quantum is per methods. I mean, there is, no, there is no way out. I mean, quantum here is not an alternative. It's the only solution to this problem that we have right now. We're just hitting a wall, okay, with AI. Yeah. So, excellent. So, so listen, multiverse is strapline. I look you up. Uh, is quantum software for extreme ideas. And Karina queued you up in, the first, in her introduction to say that you've got an important announcement to make <laughs> as, to, as to Multiverse's new product. So this is, this is a global first, everybody. So we need a bit of a drum roll. We need that gong to come back in. Uh, imagine that, obviously. OG. Yeah, no, obviously. So thanks, Karina, for building up the expectations. Okay. So <laughs> no, I mean, in connection with the previous comment, we are just releasing a new product, okay, in Multiverse, which we call Compactify. It's a whole toolbox, okay, that allows you to manipulate these new, you know, AI techniques that are so difficult to manipulate and so costly, okay, in a much more efficient way. In particular, we have built a compressor, okay, of, uh, of language models, okay, that allow you to deploy the language model in the fraction of a cost of what typically, uh, you know, uh, the traditional language model will, will use, okay? Uh, so with this, we can reduce the complexity and the cost of, say, for instance, ChatGPT by something between a 50 and an 80 percent, okay? And still maintain the accuracy. And this is huge because we are reducing the cost, okay? The money cost of running and training these systems by almost an 80 percent. And the nice thing about this is that we are also compressing it so that you can deploy it on premises because right now, you know, for all these uh, models, you need to run them on the cloud, you need to be connected to the internet. And then what happens if you want to throw it on a satellite Okay, or you want to run it on your iPhone, you can just not do it nowadays. Okay, you need an internet connection. But now with this, okay, with this product that we're releasing, which is called Compactify, you can compress it and we can actually run it even if you want on your smartwatch. Okay, so we are very happy about that. This is just the part of a toolbox um, that we are releasing for manipulating, you know, um, AI models, okay, much more efficiently using quantum inspired methods. One is able to compress them, one is able to make them erase information selectively, okay, one is able to retrain them if necessary. And obviously, we are delivering all that in a super simple way for the user, okay, because we assume that the user doesn't have any technical background on that. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and I'll leave you all to go and, and, and look that up. And, and obviously, I know I'm not doing a sales pitch. But what I would like to know is, again, just some use cases. So for those of us who are kind of new to this area, yeah. so what will be use cases in, say, finance or defense are two areas which are commonly mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. So in finance, there are obviously lots of, lots of use cases going on. We have been working, for instance, with people such as Credit Agricole and BBBA on things such as derivative and option pricing. This is a typical example in finance. No? We've also been working with people such as Ally in building ETFs, okay, in things such as index tracking, or also in trading applications, deciding whether the market is going to go up or down and deciding for the best trading strategies with BASF. We've been doing that with the finance department. 
Those are typical applications of AI systems for finance that we've been doing with quantum and quantum inspired methods. Now, since you also mentioned defense, this is also very interesting because it looks like there is, con there is lately a boom, okay, on, on defense applications, the defense and the space. Uh, no Sorry. pun intended. Yeah, Sorry. exactly. <laughs> but we are getting at multiverse right now. I think we have more than 10 projects actually related to defense and aerospace, okay? And for instance, I mean, I can mention a couple of them. So for instance, we are also deploying language models, okay, uh, for maintenance. We are doing that with the Army of Canada. We are also doing cybersecurity applications, you know, in the, in the direction of threat detection. I think they call this, um, you know, adversary generated threat intelligence, okay? That's when you let an intruder into your system in a fake environment, learn how they work, okay? And then you are able to detect uh, the intruder more efficiently, in this case with quantum computing, okay? And we're also working towards deploying language model on premises for space applications. And here, space means many things. So space means satellites, as Candance was mentioning before. No, it also means rockets, because maybe you need a language model or an AI system on a rocket. But it also means, in particular, balloons. Okay, so we have projects with balloons, and nowadays everybody, I think, understands what is the, the military usage of a balloon. No, I think the Chinese make many, very, very nice balloons. No, so <laughs> exactly. So those are some examples. Okay, and apart from that, there are many other things that are coming, and I think that situation is kind of getting very interesting. Yeah. Excellent. So, Denise, I'm going to turn to you because I think you've been doing some work as well in the area of defence with the, with the U.S. Air Force. And if there's any oh, to the extent that you can not share... Not U.S. Air Force, <laughs> so I can't... No. Um, but I have uh, met some very interesting customers that are um, interested in, for example, incoming missile detection. It turns out it takes five minutes to detect something incoming and they're looking at ways to change that time. Um, we've done a lot, or I've done a lot of um, engagements around pattern recognition on things like x-rays or how, how can you speed this up? Um, but my favorite one is uh, a company that called me and said, uh, we paint the bottom of a ship with a certain paint, and it's very organic and pollutes the ocean, and so we need to come up with a new paint. And the reason why they paint the bottom of the ship is hopefully to retard the growth of barnacles. So barnacles grow on ships and slow down the ship's uh, you know, ability to move speedily through the water. And then there also are some ports like Australia where you have to scrape the ship at a distance before you're allowed into the port. And so this customer came to me and said, can we do a new material? Can we find something to paint the bottom of the ship that retards barnacles? And so that was, that shocked me a little bit. I'd never heard that problem. And I went to a friend in the shipping industry and he said, Denise, why would you paint the bottom of a ship with a new paint? Why don't you have a coating that also helps make the ship move more quickly through the water? And so, this is kind of the fun on quantum is to listen to people's problems, think about it, think about how you could improve it, and then start the work of looking at a novel materials or developing novel materials and seeing what you can come up with. Can I ask you just to, on the um, environmental case, because that's a really interesting example. So from, again, from those from the outside, um, it could be, well, this is just a bunch of, you know, tech bros uh, or physicists doing really wacky things that has absolutely no relevance to, to humanity, or if it does, it has a very negative connotation. So, but just thinking about the environmental impact, so you were talking before, Roman, about, obviously, as we know, as being well trailed, the, um, the draws on, on, our, on our energy systems, but thinking about the role that quantum combined with AI could be playing in helping us address some of the uh, the cli uh, elements of both the climate emergency and our biodiversity uh, crisis. Yeah. Do you have some good examples? There's a, there's a lot of quantum work um, being discussed for climate. And what I want to say is quantum computers are still in their infancy. And I think that, that they need to grow a little bit before they're going to really be able to impact climate. Uh, and there are a number of startups that are working on climate. Um, Biodiversity, I don't know. 
I don't know the answer, so I would ask Roman what he thinks. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little internal joke on the I'm, panel. I'm always the backup here, I see. So. <laughs> well, I think, I think AI is, is using too much energy, so I think the carbon footprint of, of these algorithms is huge. I think, I mean, if you go to a data center or to an HPC center, they are consuming the same energy as a small town. Okay, and, and that's, that's completely, just to run a, an AI algorithm, that's completely insane, okay? This is why I was saying that the only, the only way out of this is to build more efficient algorithms and methods, and a computation actually method, and, and the only way out of this is with quantum, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Okay, Scott, I'm going to, I'm going to turn to you next as well, thinking about um, the different, you talked about your, your own company and the move from the sort of research, I've read a really interesting interview where you said you sort of, Colcomp was the, the skunk works, and now you're sort of building the new company to be the sort of production and commercial arm. So I'd be interested to hear about that journey, but also some of the new things and new areas that your own company is moving into in this area. Sure. Uh, so uh, Inflection is, uh, it's been around for 16 years. So it's, uh, it's not a startup in the quantum space. We've been around for quite some time. Um, many folks who have done enabling uh, research in the quantum space probably bought parts from us. We like to say we've been at it so long we had to invent the parts to do the research. Um, and really about two years ago we started on this transitional journey to, to move beyond research and tackle the real issue is, is I like to say how do we make more than one of something? Uh, how do we get up in the morning and don't simply get excited about getting published but how do we actually get a commercial product into the market? And, and so, uh, again, we span a, a, a wide range. I think we're probably the most comprehensive quantum company in the industry. Um, I acquired a software company right out of the bat. I felt software was really important. Um, and, you know, we see a lot of synergies between our hardware work and our software work. And so, so a really great example is um, the software team we acquired does a lot of work in control layer. This is, we're actually manipulating the atoms uh, to, to get them to do what we want to do. And, a lot of the techniques associated with doing that uh, actually are based on machine learning. And we've taken some of those techniques and we've turned those into products and turned those into other pro programs we're working on. And so two in particular here in the UK, uh, we announced last week a, a joint program with Kinetic uh, where we're starting to accelerate the work we call basically contextualized machine learning. Um, and, and what that means quite simply is, as Roman indicated, these data sets need to be trained. And so the size of the data sets kind of limits their context. Think of a book. So the first data set may be the first chapter. Um, and if you want to do two chapters, uh, the problem grows quadratically. So again, as you can see, the scaling of all of this gets to be quite problematic. And so uh, with the machine control technologies we've developed, we're, we're again working in this area where we can take extremely large data sets. We can take entire novels. We can take all the papers in a topic, for example, and contextualize them. Uh, into a data set. And so what that allows you to do is, is really find the needles in the haystack. Um, so uh, in Kinetic, we're looking at this for defense and intelligence applications. Uh, we also uh, recently were successful in a program with Wilcom Leap, uh, where we're taking the same technologies and we're applying this to life sciences. Um, and in a parallel set of, of work we've been doing AI, actually, uh, is uh, for those of you that are retail traders, um, if you go in to do your end of the year tax uh, loss harvesting trade strategy, uh, that's built on a, a module that, uh, that, we, that we build as well. So the Morningstar tax loss modules are built on AI and, and really quantum inspired knowledge that, that came out of that, uh, that, came out of that um, coding group. Excellent. So one of the things I'm quite interested in is we talk about AI as a generalizable technology. Right. Um, and we've talked about quantum as, uh, as being an umbrella term for a range of technologies. And, and later on, the first panel was talking about the, the, the importance of, of knowing your use case in the development process. So whether or not you can, um, you need that kind of use case to build through because that will, that will dictate the choices you make right at the foundational points in design and development. So, so how generalizable are the different technologies that we're talking about and to what extent does actually one need to really be thinking about a use case or a sector at the very, very early stages? Yeah, I, I think this is the conundrum of quantum. Um, and I think, you know, the, if you look at quantum computing, again, the industry tended to go gravitate what's the most complex problem in the world that we need to solve and say, aha, the, computer, the quantum computer will solve that for us. And we've now come to realize that, that that's in the future. And, and so in many cases, quantum computing is trying to find nearer term 
pragmatic, pragmatic problems that we're trying to, to, to solve. On the sensor side, which is we do a tremendous amount of work on sensors, I think it's a little more straightforward, but again, I think it's a bit of a, of a challenge there. Uh, we do a lot of work in optical clocks, and the traditional use cases for optical clocks have some constraints around them, which they're assumed to be expensive and big. And, and that's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be the case. And so if you think about if you can make the, the high performance clocks very small, make them very inexpensive, it starts to open up new use cases. And the market doesn't necessarily, they haven't thought about having that type of precision at their disposal, say at $5,000. These are traditionally several hundred thousand dollar clocks. And so you have to go actually create the market Place at the same time that you're trying to identify. And so from a, from a design perspective, um, this becomes quite challenging, how you design and build a clock that could go into a wide variety of applications, many of which haven't been invented yet, but would be invented and will be invented once the clock's available. That's a really good example. I'm going to ask Michael, um, turn to Michael next to focus on the area of finance, but then I'm going to return to this question with both Roman and Denise. So I'm just giving you a little bit of long notice, as it were, uh, that that question is going to come back to you two as well in a minute. Um, but Michael, just to um, focus on the own area, your own area that you work in in relation to finance, and one of the, uh, the big areas, in fact, one of the early users of, of AI um, has been both in finance and legal services in the context of fraud and fraud detection, um, amongst other things. So can you just, just talk us through what do you think one of the biggest problems or some of the main areas are that you see quantum perhaps combined with AI being, being able to be used for in this space? Yeah, no, um, I mean, as you mentioned, it's, it's kind of one of the go-to use cases in finance. Uh, the way I see it, there are some kind of quantum killer apps There's in finance. There's portfolio optimization, there's fraud detection, there's options pricing. And these are all the, the things that we all will get to, you know, after some time. We are in early days, and it's important to remember that. Um, that said, the, the, the path towards this is itself fruitful. And so on the way, I think, and I think it's important uh, as any company when you're approaching quantum to not come with it with a, with a use case directly in mind because you lose out on other opportunities along the way. Um, this is a good example. In fact, we, we've worked on this internally. There was a paper that we put out a couple years back uh, where we showed that you can use a quantum computer in the right cases, in the right, you know, this is not a claim of quantum advantage, to synthesize data better than classical systems we tested. Um, fraud detection is a case where this could be helpful. Um, and, and what I mean by that is when you're typically trying to teach a system to identify fraud, you want to give it a bunch of data, some fraud, some not fraud. The fact is, though, that you don't usually have a lot of fraud data to put in. <laughs> so one thing you can do is synthesize some fraud data and use that to better train. Uh, you could also use synthetic data to test models to, to, to make sure that they're working if you don't have a ton of data to use for, the, for this purpose. Uh, and I think these types of applications didn't come out of looking at how are we going to solve fraud detection. They came out of what can we do with quantum. And again, it's important to note these are not things that we claim are, you know, we didn't achieve quantum advantage. We don't think quantum computers are better at producing synthetic data, period. That's not the claim. But it is this approach to, to the technology and investigating this technology that's going to lead to fruitful discoveries on the way towards these killer apps. I'm not sure if I properly answered your question, but... <laughs> no, but I, no, but I think it's quite interesting, this actually, this, this question of if you, if you focus too narrowly on a use case, do you narrow, do you narrow down the technological um, development, scientific development, so that you end up like, this, you know, the proverbial drunk looking for the wallet under the street lamp, and you ask, well, why are you looking under the street lamp? And he says, because that's where the light is. So it, not because that's where the wallet might be, just to <laughs> round off the point. Um, but, but just to come back to this point, because I, I was just genuinely interested in this as a, as a non-specialist. This balance between the pull-through of the use yeah. case that we heard quite being argued for quite strongly in the first panel, you know, go for a moonshot, that's the thing that's got to focus you, and that will dictate your choices early on, as opposed to the... Well, I was very struck, I think, it was Nadi said, well, I developed that product, and I had no idea that Ilal was then going to use it or could use it to, to create music. Um, as opposed to do the discovery research and then see what the potential and possibilities might be. How do you, how do you between that kind of push-pull, as it were, or the discovery versus the mission uh, type approach, I mean, do we, do we risk closing down options too soon if we 
do go for those use cases, or are we at risk of developing a technology or set, umbrella set of technologies that nobody knows how to you or use or is of zero interest or application to the outside world if we don't have those use cases in mind? Ramon. Okay, so, I mean, from my perspective, and I can tell you from the experience of what has happened with, with Multiverse, is that we have, we have expanded, for instance, in finance to many use cases, and it looks like we are using many different tools, even away from finance, okay? But uh, in practice, you know, the core of the technology that we are using is always the same. We have a very good optimization algorithm. Mm -hmm. We have a very good anomaly detection quantum machine learning algorithm. And this is what we are deploying one, once and again and again and again. So, for instance, we're talking about fraud detection, no? So, we have uh, had a couple of, uh, of projects on fraud detection. We were working with a tax agency in Spain and also on a project with the Bank of Spain on anti-money laundry and so on. Mm -hmm. And those were exactly the same algorithm. It was an algorithm for anomaly detection, but exactly the the same algorithm that we were using there, we use them also for trading, for instance, or for instance, we were talking also about portfolio optimization, so the same algorithm for portfolio optimization. At some point, some energy company was interested in using that for optimization of energy markets, okay? So I think one has to distinguish very well what is the core of the technology, mm -hmm. okay, and that we can deploy very well, and then the use cases just flourish, okay, because for, you know, if you have a very good algorithm, you can apply it to a wide range of applications, okay? Excellent. Denise. So I agree with Roman. I, I think often when a company develops a good algorithm, then you can look at different areas to apply it. It's not just one algorithm is used for this, although that does happen. And then I think as you do engagements, you have periodic check-ins. And often engagements go into a completely different direction. So this would be the customer software company interaction where you're looking at your progress, you started out with one problem, but you often migrate to looking at something different because the results are interesting or, be, or because you, know, you see something different in the work that you've done. So that's actually very common. And so it's great to have this goal out there, but sometimes along the way you, you find a new goal and you find a new way to approach it. Do you have some good examples you could give us? That would, that would I don't think I could share that. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say Ramon. We don't have the clearance. We don't have the clearance. We just don't have the clearance. Um, no. Scott. No, I, I would say there's a, so there's another um, aspect to the question is that none of this is happening in a vacuum. Um, this is, all this discovery, all the, this effort is moving forward um, with investor commitment and government commitment. And I, I think I just came. I just came from the Quantum World Congress in in D.C. this week, and I, I kind of heard this quietly. Um, but the, the event this week was the first time I publicly heard anyone say, say on stage um, that quantum needs a win. Um, there, there's got to be a use case that stands up that's a compelling commercial use case, whether it's in software, whether it's in hardware, whether wherever it is. Um, we're five years into a funding cycle and an extremely complex technology, and we're in a race. I mean, you mentioned that there is a race behind this, and, yeah, but, but I would say there's starting, there's cracks, there's fatigue starting to show uh, where's the wind gonna come, and, and it's a hard question where the wind's gonna come, and you know, I've been at this for 30 years, I've built two public companies. My experience has told me the wind comes from someplace you're not looking. Right? Now, where that is and how it comes, who knows, but it generally is coming, it's a blind side. You have, to, you have to be opportunistic, you have to be able to pivot to, to, to address it. I think, you know, I think the greatest thing that happened to quantum was AI. Um, they are integrally connected. AI needs quantum to scale, and I think that's becoming more and more evident um, in, in a variety of areas. But, but I think there's got to be a win here in the next couple of years, or I think we're going to start to see more signs of fatigue. Excellent. And Michael, your own perspective. And also just thinking about just, again, coming back to this link between um, quantum and AI, what kind of hurdles do you anticipate there being in, in leveraging quantum machine learning algorithms in, in the future? Yeah, we, we do have a fair number to get over, I think. But, you know, I, we're on the way. Um, I think one thing that, that, actually this is relevant, I think, you know, typically when we think of quantum machine learning, um, we think of replacing our systems. When I say we, I mean it's, it's understood, uh, and I'm about to correct it. <laughs> uh, we imagine replacing our systems with just a big quantum computer that's going to do this machine learning thing for us. Uh, that's not how it's going to work. 
at least it's very unlikely. What's going to happen is that we're going to have a new type of hardware that gets integrated into our high performance computing systems, uh, the, the quantum processing unit. A lot of you know of GPUs, it'll just be another, another type of chip that goes in there. And there will be certain tasks in the end to end machine learning implementations that get sent to the QPU. Um, I raise this because I think one of the biggest hurdles is, and it was kind of just noted here, we need to figure out which task to send to the QPU. <laughs> um, it's, it's well motivated that there will be things that will be well done on quantum systems, but we don't yet have a clear picture of, yes, this is the type of thing where when, you know, we have a clear picture of what that pathway is going to look like once we integrate these chips. Uh, another big hurdle, and actually this was mentioned earlier this morning, and I think it's, it's often overlooked, is that there's been excellent work into developing quantum algorithms and demonstrating how they're going to speed up classical ones, by which I mean they'll take fewer steps. But at the same time, we need to get data in and out of these systems. And if it takes more steps than we've saved to get data in and out, <laughs> then we've kind of completely counteracted the benefit that we're hoping to get out of these things. Um, George just mentioned this this morning, and I think it is an important point. Uh, I think that's a hurdle that we're gonna have to overcome and we're not going to find that it's going to be great for everything, but we're going to find that it will help us to identify those tasks that will be sent to the QPUs in that end-to-end -end implementation in the future. I imagine you want to get some responses from others, and so perhaps I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, mean, I think in, I mean, we're seeing this. Um, again, the, the challenge right now is the, on, the, on the compute side, the tendency is to build large computers. Really interesting stuff that doesn't, happens on the edge. Um, again, we do a lot of work in sensing, so there's some really amazing stuff that can be done in quantum sensing on the edge, albeit, you know, if you could add the compute to it, they're, they're, they're not physically located to each other. So I, I agree. I think what we're starting to see even is uh, in the near term is more what I call application-specific uh, QPUs, um, where a small number of not-so-great qubits uh, can be set up in a way to look at a very singular activity. Um, it resides out where that singular activity is happening, whether that's on a satellite or whether that's on a submarine or, again, whether that's an edge somewhere. Um, and, and the challenge, the business challenge, is how do you make these things now small enough and expensive enough that you can distribute that. Uh, so I think there's going to be variants of not only centralized QPUs, but this, this world of kind of application-specific QPUs that start to evolve as well. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit for a minute about quantum advantage. And so quantum advantage is the moment that a quantum computer outperforms classical computing. And I think that you're going to hear a lot of companies talk about quantum advantage or quantum supremacy. And it really is a goal for a lot of companies right now, mostly hardware companies, to achieve this. And I think we'll see it over the next... I'm going to say three years, I don't know, that's a guess. Um, but it's going to be in a very small problem. It's not going to be something that's universal, that all of a sudden quantum has exceeded all classical computing. And so I think it's important as all of us move forward looking at quantum to understand that if there's an example, it's probably just for that problem, but it's a really good um, indication that the industry has promise and that we need to keep growing the industry. And I think we need some positives in the industry and this could be a positive. Um, but again, it, take it with a grain of salt because it will be in one area or one specific algorithm alone. Yep. Actually, if I can make a comment about that, I think this is a very good point. So one, you know, quantum advantage is a concept that is for academia. Okay, it's an academic concept that, uh, you know, it's a theoretical benchmark, okay, for quantum computers. Okay, but that doesn't mean that it's something that is going to be useful for, for business. And, and, you know, I know also from the European Commission and so on, people are now starting to use a different, a different jargon. They are, they are talking about business advantage, okay? So when a quantum computer is going to be useful for business applications, and that's, that's a completely different benchmark that has nothing to do with a mathematical benchmark, which is quantum advantage, okay? Because, I don't know, it may be useful for a business, uh, for, for many 
including many reasons, because you are saving time, you are saving money, because you just want to try quantum for whatever reason, and so on, okay? So business advantage is what should matter to industry, okay? And we have it very clear uh, in, in multiverse. And quantum advantage is a theoretical concept, okay? That is for academia, and it's a good benchmark for quantum computers. Now, having said that, it's also a very difficult benchmark to actually, to actually understand, because there have been many claims about quantum advantage, and sooner or later they have been disproved. I mean, there was one also recently by some company that makes hardware that starts with I and ends with them, okay? That was disproved by several people, including us. We had a paper last week where we proved that we could simulate it not just for the processor they had, but they also for the one they have now and the one that they are going to release this year. So, so this is something, by the way, using quantum-inspired methods, okay? The same ones that we are using in, in Compactify, no? So quantum advantage is something that when you hear about somebody telling, whoa, no, we are getting advantage, be careful, because it may be restricted to a very academic problem, and it may be that in a very short term there is some other, you know, computational scientist that is able to simulate it in some way or another. But that doesn't mean that the quantum computer is not useful for a business application. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So I cannot, I cannot leave this panel <laughs> as a as a signed up social scientist and uh, regulatory lawyer without asking you this question, which is how do we how do we ensure that all the developments you're talking about uh, in quantum and both quantum and AI and particularly together occur in a way which ensures that it's being developed in a way which is responsible um, and which maximizes the, the chances that it might be used for the benefit of humanity and the planet rather than their disadvantage. Oh, Michael's leapt on, jump on this an, one. He's an LSE <laughs> alum, by the way. So. Um, can you tell I have an opinion? Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think that there is one uh, big issue right now that, that we need to start addressing, which is just equitable access to education and systems. Um, I think that the only way that we can ensure that we end up with this benefiting everyone equally is making sure that everyone can access it equally, and we're really far from that. Don't ask me for any kind of suggestions on how, though. That's <laughs> it's, it's a good moonshot. Scott? Yeah, I, I think that's, um, this is a challenge, I agree. I think, uh, uh, you know, this is technology deployed one way can divide the world, and deployed another way can be a great democratizer. And I think that that's the choice that, that we have, and I think this is the choice a lot of governments are struggling with as they think about uh, restrictions around the technology, restrictions around the core technology. There's a trade-off. I think there's a balance um, left unchecked, and bad things can happen, but uh, overchecked, it won't happen. And, and I think you know we're involved in a lot of these discussions. And I think we were talking earlier. I you know my, my last industry, which was autonomous vehicles, we we, we had the same dilemma of, of autonomous vehicle technology and. A self-driving car having two poor choices to make, and how does it make those choices? Because there's lives at stake. Denise, this is this is a tough question. Um, I think there's been a lot of discussions. I think uh, Ileana Wisby has been involved in a, a video on ethics. So there's a lot of talk about ethics. Um, with respect to AI or with respect to quantum computing. And I think that is something that will come with time, but I think that the industry is still very new. And um, so I think it's something we'll work towards. Um, so that's my opinion on that. Okay, so my, my opinion is that, well, this may look a bit dangerous, but it's also not the first time that this happens in the history of humanity. So every time that there has been a new technology, we have we had to decide how do we make it ethical. I mean, if you if you remember when, you know, when they developed, I mean, I don't know if you have seen Oppenheimer, okay? That's the actual story of how they build the atomic bomb. So when we release the power of the atom, how can we make it, you know, for the benefit of humanity and not just for destruction, no? So, well, you know, you just start building regulations, ethical committees, and so on. And in this case, with AI and with quantum, it's going to be exactly the same, in my opinion. It's going to be different, tailored to the actual applications. We need to keep human control and so on. But it's exactly the same story that is repeating itself, yeah. Excellent, thank you. I think you'll agree that has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Uh, we could go on and monopolize your entire afternoon, but you'll probably be quite relieved to say that we're not going to do that. But I would like you please to show a round of appreciation and applause for the panel. Thank you.